When we left Michigan just under 10 years ago, we took a last hurrah vacation to this lake that uh, was just outside this little town called Colon, Michigan. And there's so many jokes when you stay in a town called Colon, Michigan. But Colon is actually known not for food processing. So that was a joke right there, Richie. Not for food processing. So good I say it again. But for magic, they call themselves the magic capital. And they have this magic festival every summer. And we were there during the magic festival. So that summer, walking around the festival, I bought this used magic book at a sidewalk sale, thinking it'd be cool to know, maybe a trick or two. And I learned one just in time for the holidays that I could amaze my family with. Sleight of hand, I'll tell you, is this awesome, amazing thing. First, what I was really doing in the trick. So I do this trick in front of my brother, my dad, mom, and I go through the trick. And what, the, what I was really doing was way more simple than what my family actually thought I was doing. They had all these convoluted things that I'd done to make the trick work. And it was one little tiny twist, far easier than what I thought it was. They thought it was. And then second, I realized then that half the fun is that we all wanted to believe, my whole family wanted to believe, they wanted it to be magic, right? They wanted it to be this elaborate thing that I was doing and that I had learned. And it wasn't nearly that. But to some degree, this idea that we want life to be magic, it's kind of like that with our money, isn't it? We invest in something. We become emotionally invested. Like, say, maybe with, I don't know, with Bitcoin. Live from the little three-room apartment above Uncle Jack's garage. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe Saul Cihai, Average Joe Money on Twitter. This show is called Money in the Morning. It's a place where we go over not one, but two headlines ripped from the financial press. And then we don't just read those headlines. We also talk about them and extrapolate them. What the heck do these things have to do with your money? We go over that. And as if that's not enough, as icing on the cake, we also then at the end of the show have this thing we call the big idea where we put these two together and send you home with a big idea for the day. Money in the Morning is brought to you by Tiller. Tiller is the spreadsheet-based money tracking and budgeting system. Perfect for you if you're one of two people, if you like your spreadsheets mean and complex, it's a lot of spreadsheet people. Or even if you're like me, I'm the opposite of that spectrum. I wanna know what's going on quickly. I want less lines and Tiller does that too. And we'll explain why that is later on here in the show. But to check it out, stackybenjamins.com forward slash Tiller gets you there. That's uh, how you tell them that we sent you. If you're going to use Tiller and you use our link, they send us a little thank you along the way for, uh, for you using our link. That's it. Stackybenjamins.com forward slash Tiller. All right. We've got a great show today. Two fantastic headlines lined up. So Laura, why don't you get this party started? Here are today's Money in the Morning headlines. Ready, set, go. Go! First headline comes to us from CNBC, and this is written by Stephanie Landsman. This little talked about correlation suggests Bitcoin may end year explosively higher, in quotes, says Tom Lee. Uh, explosively higher for Bitcoin. Wouldn't that be nice? For those of you that don't track Bitcoin, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies have lost tons of money since January. And people that are in Bitcoin want to look for correlations. And Bitcoin is so new that it's hard to find correlation. Like as an example, when one stock goes up, generally speaking in a market, if, if other stocks are in, in the same market doing the same thing, they have this thing called correlation where they all might go up. In fact, on an average day, most stocks kind of drift higher, drift lower based on what the broad market does. And then when they have news or they report earnings, whatever happens maybe in their sector, they'll react to that. Or they might react to news that affects their sector. So, so let's say that it's a, it's a mining company and something happens with mining equipment. Well, maybe it has nothing to do with that company specifically today, 
but you'll see the stock move. And by the way, when it comes to investing in stocks, a lot of the time, that's what you want to look at is not what they call the first domino. You want to look at the second domino. So this, this thing that just happened today, not how does that directly play out in the market? Cause everybody's on that one. The real winners are the people who say, what does that do two and three and four dominoes down? Like what, what company might be affected by that in the future? And I'll give you an example before we dig into this headline that's happening in our Facebook group, the, the uh, basement. If you head to stackybedjamins.com forward slash basement, you'll get a link to go there. But one thing we've been talking about there is about cannabis stocks. And we had a guest on recently, Jordan Waldrip from the Vice Fund, talking specifically about this as cannabis becomes legalized. And let's say that this trend continues and that does happen. Who do you look at? Well, maybe you look at the tobacco companies because tobacco companies already are, they've already got all the smoking machinery ready. And if it becomes socially acceptable to sell these smokes places, Places like Philip Morris that already have it all, Altria, that already have this laid out, right? Those companies could be big winners. We don't know that, but that's what I mean by a couple dominoes down. People don't initially think about some of the tobacco companies there. And that's the discussion that we're having. But let's have a different discussion today. And let's talk about Bitcoin. And is there some correlation with Bitcoin and some other things? And Tom Lee here says Bitcoin might end your explosively higher with this little talked about correlation. So, uh, Stephanie Landsman writes, if you're trying to figure out when Bitcoin slump will end, you may want to look at the emerging markets. According to Fundstrat Global Advisors, Thomas Lee, there's an important correlation budding between emerging markets and Bitcoin, the most dominant coin in the cryptocurrency space. Both really essentially peaked early this year, and they both have been in a downward trend. The firm's head of research said Friday on CNBC's Trading Nation, until emerging markets begin to turn, I think in some ways that correlation is going to hold and tell us that some of the risk on on mentality is those buyers aren't buying Bitcoin. The iShares MSCI Emerging Markets Index ETF is down about 8% so far this year. It's painful, but not as much as the epic Bitcoin sell-off. Bitcoin's buying frenzy came to a virtual screeching halt shortly after reaching a record just shy of 20,000 last December. Since then, the cryptocurrency has fallen by 65%. Now trading as we record this in the 6,000s since August 8th. Lee contends hedge funds aren't buying risk when emerging markets sell off. The recent trading activity suggests they aren't buying Bitcoin either, but that bearish trend could be about 10. Lee, who owns Bitcoin and has been among the biggest bulls on Wall Street, says the tide changing in favor of both areas of the market, especially if the dollar weakens and the Federal Reserve slows its interest rate hike policy. He also points out there's big money and firepower on the sidelines in the cryptocurrency space. Those factors could help Bitcoin surge to 25,000 as 2018 winds down, according to Lee. I still think it's possible, said Lee, Bitcoin could end the year explosively higher. Remember what I said about magic earlier? I think Mr. Lee is hoping for some magic. Because let's start off with, with, with what happened here. And you always got to go to the bottom of the piece first, kids. You always go to the bottom because when you hit the bottom of the piece, you get what's actually going on. Lee owns Bitcoin. Lee is looking for a correlation between Bitcoin and we'll call it freaking anything. Something that's going to say that Bitcoin's going to go up. He's been one of the biggest bulls. He's been somebody who, and in his, his job, his job is to make a call. And if he owns the thing, well, hell, he wants it to go up. He's going to point at anything he can find that's going to make Bitcoin go up. And it's sad. I mean, you see that in politics. You see it on money shows. You see it all over the place. Somebody's invested in something, and so they got to tout it. And when it's off, and when it's not doing well, and people say, well, why are you still holding on to that? Well, here's a reason why. Because emerging markets are down, and because of that, Bitcoin is down. I think this is tenuous at best. And I think that it's dangerous because here's what happens. If you own Bitcoin, you know what you start doing at a time like now? You start going online, reading anything that you can possibly find, right? Anything that you can find. And you find this cool piece that says that somebody says Bitcoin's going up. And they don't say until the end of the piece that this dude owns Bitcoin. 
Of course he's going to say it goes up. But you know what that does? It makes you feel better. It makes you sleep better at night. Because you think that Bitcoin emerging markets are now correlated. And guess what? Emerging markets, there's a lot of people who followed emerging markets for a long time. And they get it. They understand how emerging markets works. And I'll say this. I think emerging markets, you know, it's always volatile. So what do you do with emerging markets? I love emerging markets, by the way. You hang on. You, historically, you just hang on to emerging markets. And you're through the floor. And then you're through the roof. And then guess what, by the way? You're through the floor again. And if you're dollar cost averaging in, that volatility is your buddy. It is your buddy. If you dollar cost average in, and then you continually rebalance your portfolio, oh baby, emerging markets is great. Because you win when it's up, and you win when it's down. If you don't need the money right away. And how do you win when it's down, you're asking? Because I'm dollar cost averaging in, I'm buying shares at a cheaper price. Dollar cost averaging means I'm continually putting money in every month as the stock goes down. So as I see emerging markets, exchange traded funds go down, I continually buy. Is that the case with Bitcoin, Joe? Should I just keep buying Bitcoin while it goes down? I don't know. And the reason is, is because a lot of these coins have been a dumpster fire. Just absolute chaos in that market. And with regulation coming, there's just Emerging markets, I mean, I know they're called emerging markets because they're not established markets, but the way you trade emerging markets is very well established. The machinery is in place. With Bitcoin, we're still rolling out the machinery. So we don't know where it's going. And that sucks to hear, but, uh, but I think that's our takeaway. Correlation between Bitcoin and emerging markets? Yeah, probably not. I hope so. I like the idea of it. I, I think we're reaching on this one. Uh, let's say hi to our friends who are hanging out with us on Facebook today. Nobody really talking Bitcoin today. Before we started, we were talking Bavaria and pretzels and um, cooler weather. But uh, Daryl's here. We got Ryan here. Aaron's here. Chris is here today. Uh, thanks, guys, for hanging out with us this morning. Let's move on to our second piece. Uh, before we do that, Chris just showed up with a comment and says, you and OG should set up a drinking game of Bitcoin versus blank correlation. He'd be happy to oblige. That would be awesome. Like a drinking game where somebody's searching for a correlation. Because I bet we'll find 50 of these, Chris. I, I didn't have to look hard for one. I'm with you. I think we find, we find a, a bunch of them. Let's move on to our second piece, which comes to us from Forbes. And I know there's this couple that doesn't get any press. Brad and Angelina, you never hear about them, I know. So we're going to bring them up. Uh, this little-known couple, Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie. Uh, and this piece, though, is a great financial planning piece, personal finance piece, written by Megan Gorman on Forbes. How Brad and Angelina are using intrafamily loans to manage their divorce. Breaking up is hard to do, and apparently that's the case with Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie. In the two years since their split, a heavy drama has played out in the press. Amidst their recent public skirmishes, an interesting fact appeared. Pitt has made a loan to Jolie for $8 million to buy a home after their separation. In fact, Jolie's attorney, Samantha Bladegeen, told People Magazine in regard to the loan that, quote, Brad was asked to assist in the expense of a new home for Angelina and their six children, but instead he loaned Angelina money for which he's charging her interest on a payment plan. While it might seem that Pitt's being cold to his soon-to-be ex and their six children, the loan was actually a clever financial planning strategy. In Pitt's case, the use of an intrafamily loan is helpful when navigating a divorce proceeding since there's not yet a divorce settlement he needs to be careful about making any unintended gifts to his soon-to-be ex-wife. A properly structured loan, this is a quote, uh, can be a powerful tool to maintain control over the use of the proceeds. It may also be a way to fund a business transaction or a mar marital dissolution, said Glenn Christofides, a New York and New Jersey tax and estate attorney who's not advising either Pitt or Jolie. In Pitt's case, helping Jolie buy a house through the use of a loan maintains clarity during a divorce proceeding. In the world of tax planning, intrafamily or below market loans are fairly common to help family members buy a home or to provide liquidity and estate planning. But before going down the path, it's key to understand all the risks involved. The fundamentals 
of below market loans. Regardless of the reason for a below market loan, it must always be based on good faith. In Pitt's case, he's merely trying to keep his family in a home appropriate for their situation. When structuring the loan, basic loan requirements must be met to ensure the loan is not seen as a gift. The IRS will look at various factors, including whether there's a signed written loan. Signed written loan agreement? Yes, live radio. Joe didn't take care of that. I love that. When structuring the loan, basic loan requirements must be met to ensure the loan's not seen as a gift. The IRS is going to look at various factors, including whether there's a signed written loan agreement with a fixed repayment schedule and a stated interest rate. Further, the loan holder must report the payments on their tax return. In the event the loan was secured against real property, the payor may even be able to deduct it as mortgage interest up to the legal limit. The emphasis on correct documentation structure is important and should be done in coordination with an attorney and CPA, as Christified's notes. If these aspects of the transaction are not properly addressed, an intended lender can find himself with a non-collectible debt. Further, setting an interest rate is not a random decision. Below market in the tax context means an interest rate below a statutory rate called the applicable federal rate, AFR. The AFR has historically been lower than commercial rates, currently less than 3%. It's easy to have a loan that's below market in the common sense, but still not below market in the legal sense, explains Christifieds. It's funny how many people this applies to, and yet they don't even know that this exists. The fact that you can have a below market loan to somebody, and it doesn't have to be, by the way, in this divorce situation, you can have a below market loan to anybody and uh, people can write off on their taxes. It can be, and it should be, a legal document. And the big thing here is if it's not written down as a legal document and according to IRS guidelines and the person defaults on the loan, you might have a loan that's impossible to collect. Because all the person has to do is say, this isn't within the guidelines, I will submit that this was a gift. So you got to be very careful if you're going to do loans to family members. And you see this all the time, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to loan you 10000 bucks. Lots of guidelines there. Has to be in writing. Has to be uh, uh, an interest rate that correlates with where, where the IRS is at the time. Lots of little legal things. But in this case, even for the divorce plan, I think this is interesting. Giving her a loan says, I'm not making an unintended gift to you that later on you're going to get half of, right? That we're going to split. We're not going to, we're not going to do that. No, instead, we've already separated our stuff. Now I'm going to loan you money so that we can track exactly where things are. Smart move. I think the, the thing is, I think the lesson here is people say to keep your friends close. Keep your friends close. Keep your enemies close but keep it all in writing. I think when you keep things in writing and above board, everybody wins. And that's our second takeaway from our second piece today. Hey, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit here about Tiller before we get to our big idea. We close out the show here every day with this big idea. How are we going to take Brad and Anjali and Bitcoin and put them all together for a big idea for you to take home. We're going to do that in just a minute. But first, I promise you a little more about Tiller and how it works. The big magic thing that Tiller does, people that love spreadsheets, they have a one difficult thing, and that is making sure that all their transactions get into the spreadsheet. And that can sometimes take hours, looking at your investments, looking at your bake transactions, putting them all into the sheet. Well, Tiller does that seamlessly and does it confidentially, and does it in a way that you're able to make your sheet work however you want at the same time. If you're sick of apps that kind of three-quarters of the way or halfway meet your needs, Tiller can give you the flexibility that you want. For somebody like me, I like to keep it really easy. For someone like me, I can even make the spreadsheets, the templates that give me easier. So it's like having an app that I design myself it's already 99% design, but I'm like, yeah, I don't like that feature. I want to combine these two things. Boom, I can do it. And that's the power of the spreadsheet. I think some people hear spreadsheet, and I think that makes it harder. Spreadsheets for me with Tiller makes it easier. StackyBenjamins.com forward slash Tiller gets you there. And if you decide to, to try it out, use our link, and um, you also support the show. 
Tiller sends us a thank you for sending you there. So thanks to everybody who's used our link when they're checking out Tiller. Lots of great stuff, by the way. Lately, I've been reading on Reddit about Tiller, which is awesome. I've seen the crazy Redditors talk about how awesome this program is. People are just starting to get it, that it's even out there. And I love the fact that we were kind of at the beginning of the Tiller wave. Well, actually, I take that back. We were way before the beginning. Uh, I met Peter before the launch of Tiller. And the fact that the product he's come out with is even better than the product I thought it was when I met Peter four years ago, maybe five years ago, even. Holy cow. Love seeing what they're doing over there. StackyBenjamins.com forward slash Tiller. Let's talk about our big idea today. And this is how we end our show each uh, podcast on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. So we started off talking about Bitcoin and about people looking for this magic of correlation, right? Let's please say that there's some end to this misery and it's going to end with unicorns and rainbows and great things. So this author talks about Bitcoin and emerging markets. And while it sounds nice, it sounds great, not sure that there's really correlation there. Big takeaway there, read the bottom of the piece. Turns out the person they're quoting owns a lot of Bitcoin, really bullish on Bitcoin, looking for reasons to love it, even though it's down 65% or more, um, depending on <laughs> where we're at when, when this podcast actually drops versus when we're recording it. The second one, Brad and Angelita, using loans. This idea of loans below market. If you loan money to people, you want to make sure, family members, you want to make sure that that's in writing, that you follow IRS guidelines, then you'll be able to collect on the loan. Otherwise, it might really just be a gift, which is the guideline anyway, right? They say when you give a family member money, probably ends up being a gift. But if you want it legal, which in this case, Brad and Angelina do, you want to do a lot of things correctly. So I think I'd have some help writing that up to keep your friends close and your enemies closer. But I think on both of these, you want to do something. I think the intersection of both of these pieces and our big idea for today is this. When I was doing magic, I used some sleight of hand. And the sleight of hand was usually different than what people thought it was at first glance. And I'm sure if they thought about it long enough and they got rid of this idea that they just love magic and they kind of want it to be magical, they want it to be happy and magical, pull back from that and study your premise, I think you'll find the real premise might be more simple than you thought it was. And it also might be closer to the truth. And I think that's the case in, in, in both of these. You know, what Brad could have done with his premise, he's got six kids as a spouse. I want to make sure that they're, they're in a house. He could have just given her the money. Not great planning. Because at this point, he needs to make sure that he keeps track of what money's his and what money is hers and certainly help the family. So what does he do? He uses a loan to get that done. By looking at the premise but thinking more critically about, about it, Brad Pitt, Angelina Jolie, getting this more firm separation of their stuff. Nice financial planning case. On the other side, the premise is Bitcoin going to find a way back and that there's got to be a correlation somewhere. Sure, there does. But we haven't been through a full market cycle with Bitcoin, so we don't know. And if we study the premise of Bitcoin emerging market, a lot more tenuous. Than, than we might have thought at first. And I think that's our big takeaway. Think hard about your premise. A lot of times that first thing you think, not usually it. Don't fall in love with the first premise. Think strongly through it. I've got a friend right now thinking about designing a new product, called me up a few days ago and said, Joe, I'm in love with this idea, which scares me. So I want you to punch holes in it. Cool thing was I wasn't able to punch holes in it, but even cooler was the fact that he recognized that he was in love with the premise and that there must be something wrong. And as we went through what could go wrong, we realized at this point in the idea, it's about implementation. The idea seems sound to him, to me, to other people that he trusts. Now it's about implementation, and I can't wait to see what he does. But the fact that he thought hard and questioned his premise, something I don't see a lot of. All right, that's going to do it for today. Hey, thanks, everybody, for hanging out. We got Richard here late. Hey, Richard, glad you could join us. Uh, everybody that hung out on Facebook, thank you very much. Everybody hanging out, listening to the audio of this podcast, thanks a ton. And by the way, to everybody who's left us a review, thanks a real ton to you. In fact, 
This one is going on mom's refrigerator. We thought this was this was a funny one. Let me pull this up. Uh, five stars from uh, Iron Richard. Uh, enjoying money in the morning. I enjoy the way Joe provides financial information in a meaningful way that helps to understand what's important about it and why. Being a relatively short podcast helps to avoid going into too much detail beyond that which is needed to make the point. Thanks, Iron Richard. And uh, mom's putting that on the fridge here. All right, everybody. Have a great day. Go Stacks and Benjamins. We'll see you next time back here at Money in the Morning. Money in the Morning is created by Joe Saul Cihai and comes to your ears because of the collective genius of our producer, Richie Rutter reese engineer, Caden Thompson, and a pack of very well-trained ferrets here in the basement. You'll find links to all of our headlines featured on today's show in Joe's Twitter feed at at Average Joe Money. I know you already know this too, but Money in the Morning is for entertainment purposes only. You shouldn't act on anything recommended by a bunch of entertainers in a basement without first consulting with your financial advisor and second, having your head examined. Have a headline you'd like us to discuss? Send them to Joe at stackingbenjamins.com or put them on our Stacking Benjamins Basement closed Facebook group. This show is copyright 2018 Stacking Benjamins LLC, all rights reserved. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I reserve the right to always say, we'll see you next time back here on Money in the Morning.